We'll keep it moving the best we can. I'm Senator Elder Vogel, Chairman of the Senate Ag Committee. I have the Senator Judy Schwank with me, as well as our Representative Kyle's and Representative Pashinsky here. And we um, are going to talk about a very important subject, a very timely subject, uh, something that we actually moved this hearing up about a month or so because of the impact it's having, and, the Im and we feel that we need to get the information out to the representatives and senators, as well as uh, the public at large. So uh, I'll let the other uh, people here introduce themselves, and we'll uh, get going with Secretary Redding. Uh, thank you, Chairman Vogel, Chairman Kauser, and Chairman Pashinsky for bringing us here together this morning. Um, this is very important to us um, that, you know, living in Berks County, that where we're the epicenter of the problem, that we're able to have a discussion about this and perhaps develop a plan for the following year. The spotted lanternfly was first discovered in my county in 2014, just three years ago. And we've been at the forefront at fighting uh, this invasive pest. I think it's so important to recognize that before 2014, no one had ever seen the spotted lanternfly on this side of the planet. It wasn't in South America, it wasn't in Canada, and now it's here and has spread rapidly to other counties. I've toured impacted areas and I've seen the damage they can do firsthand. I have them in my own backyard as well. It's my hope that this meeting will provide useful information for everyone impacted by lanternflies. This is no longer just an agricultural problem alone or a rural problem. It's a problem for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and we're going to need a statewide plan to deal with this. I'd like to note um, in our audience today our county commissioner chair, Commissioner Christian Leinbach is here as well, who's been very active on this issue. And a number of individuals are here from Penn State as well. So I'm looking forward to what we're going to learn today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with all of you to discuss this very important issue. I'm looking forward to the information that's going to be presented. We've got an impressive uh, list of testifiers this morning. So I think it's going to be a, uh, I'm hoping that it's going to be a great discussion. Um, other than what I've read, I have to confess that I don't know a lot about this issue, so I'm looking forward, as I said, to the information presented. Representative Maloney has talked to me about it extensively, and I know what an issue uh, it's been in, in that region. And uh, so I look forward to the information, and thank you for everyone who uh, is here today. Good morning, everyone. Representative Pashinsky, um, I think Senator Schwank and uh, Senator Vogel and um, Chairman Causer has made the point I welcome everyone here, look forward to the, um, uh, to the presentation, and uh, want to move right on, give you all enough time. Thank you. If the other, if the other members want to just quickly introduce themselves, then we'll get to Secretary Redding, so go ahead and start. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Senator Ryan Ahmet, 36th Senatorial District, Northern Lancaster County. Representative Marsha Hahn from Northampton County. Representative Mindy Fee from Northern Lancaster. Hmm. Good morning. State Rep Dave Maloney, Berks County. I am not on the Ag Committee, but obviously, as it's been already mentioned, I've probably been impacted and been in a effects of this more than anybody here and um, so I look forward to this today so thank you Good morning everybody Russ Diamond uh, state rep from Eastern Lebanon County right next door to Berks County good morning Mark Keller representative of the 86th district which is all of Perry and part of Cumberland County Mr. Chairman, uh, good morning um, uh, to each of you, uh, Chairman Schwank and uh, Chairman Kauser and uh, Pashinsky. Thank you uh, to each of the members of the committee. Uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to be here and to share 
uh, what we uh, in the Department of Agriculture are doing to combat and uh, uh, control the spotted lanternfly. Uh, I'll be uh, sensitive to time, just knowing that we've got a full agenda and you have a schedule to keep as well. But also uh, to say that we've got some folks on the, uh, the witness list here who I think are extraordinary. And, and they'll impart sort of what they're doing, both as public servants for the Commonwealth and U.S. Department of Agriculture, but also our land-grant university. And uh, you have two producers who will share uh, sort of the implication of both living with, but also the economic implications of of the spotted lanternfly. So I just want to take a moment and say thanks for your interest and continued support of agriculture and uh, uh, working with us uh, on this strategy. As uh, Senator Schwenk has noted, uh, our goal is uh, you know, to come out of this meeting with a little more uh, insight and awareness by all uh, on what it is that we are confronting, uh, what the implications are to both the Commonwealth and I would say to the United States, uh, because this is not only about what Pennsylvania does now, it's what, what happens to us, uh, both by trading partners potentially, but also what we do in just general commerce. Uh, and that'll be uh, part of the conversation. But uh, please know that we have been working since 2014 when this was first identified uh, to really uh, understand it, um, try to figure out the, the, the biology of, of this, the habits of this uh, pest. Uh, it is invasive in so many ways. Uh, we really are, are uh, fortunate to have uh, the resources we have through the USDA uh, and the human capital available to us from uh, the Penn State University, the College of Ag, and the research team. And I'll, I'll make note of uh, a couple of folks who are here in just a moment. Uh, but to say that you know, despite the efforts, um, this pest has spread. Uh, it began uh, in Berks County, as noted, uh, at the epicenter, but now uh, really consumes the southeast part of Pennsylvania. Uh, and we fear that it's not contained there. Uh, that was part of the conversation. But all of that to say we remain hopeful um, that we can find a con uh, control strategy that allows us to um, address the issues, uh, offer some peace of mind to the citizens of Pennsylvania uh, and the quality of life that they uh, expect. Uh, but we also know that we have economic implications for agriculture, uh, not, uh, uh, not just in the uh, Berks County area, but really across the state. And the potential impact of that we'll, we'll share, share today. Uh, but the hopefulness um, you know, comes from what we've done in the past with eradicating the plum pox virus. And, and some of the members of the committee uh, committees are aware of that work over uh, years. And uh, uh, we're, we're pleased to say today that we were successful in eradicating the plum pox virus as one example of the teamwork uh, that went into that uh, as well. Uh, we know that we have an exceptional team, and, and you'll meet uh, several of those members today uh, from the Department of Agriculture, uh, Dana Rhodes, who's our state uh, plant regulatory official, uh, as well as uh, Sven uh, Spichinger, uh, who's the entomology program manager, uh, Dr. Ruth Welliver. Uh, so those two are on, on the, the, the list here this morning to offer some insight. And we'll walk you through and guide you through sort of the, the background and some of the history and, and our strategy. But they are led by uh, Dr. Ruth Welliver, who is our Bureau of Plant Industry Director. Uh, and we're pleased to have uh, Dr. Julie Urban, who's a Senior Research Associate with Penn State University College of Ag Science. And, and uh, she is uh, available to us today. But underscoring this is a partnership and absolutely impossible to do without the work and support of both the U.S. Department of Agriculture, who, as you've heard me say many times, the partnership between the State Department of Agriculture and the USDA, uh, they're almost inseparable. Right, both on food safety and plant and animal. This is one more, uh, one more case of that. Uh, but after uh, fighting uh, this spotted lanternfly for several years, we also understand that we are facing a new threat uh, whose uh, behavior and biology uh, continues to unfold. And, and you'll hear it this morning just what that means uh, for us. So let, let me stop there uh, to say thank you uh, at the outset for opportunity. Look forward to the conversation, the questions, and dialogue that will follow uh, the presentations. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. So at this time, we'll have uh, Sven Spichter, Entomology Program Manager, and, and Dana Rhodes from the Department of Agriculture come forward and uh, give us their testimony at this time.
All right, good morning, and uh, thank you for asking us to present here today. So first and foremost, uh, as uh, Secretary Redding pointed out, this really is a, a group effort, and you'll see a lot of logos up here on the first screen that we have, and that's because very, uh, very soon uh, after we found this, we started working with places like uh, Berks County, for example, Kutztown University, the USDA, Penn State. Uh, everybody really did chip in very quickly to try to find solutions uh, for this new pest. So I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, started out with cooperation from the Pennsylvania Game Commission. An off-duty Game Commission educator actually reported this um, uh, from private property in Berks County, uh, damaging Tree of Heaven, which is also known as Alanthus. So I'll use Tree of Heaven and Alanthus interchangeably throughout my talk. And this is unusual. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain why that is later. Uh, the report detailed uh, severe damage uh, buildup of really kind of a gross substance called sooty mold and presence of stinging insects. And that's what really alarmed him was stinging insects coming to his trees. And he noticed something that he didn't recognize. Uh, we visited that day and we were able to identify something called Lycorma delicatula, which you now know as the spotted lanternfly. Yeah. Now, lanternflies are really not typically found in North America. There's only 17 species. So we have about 700 species of lanternflies, which are in the family Fulgoridae in the entire world. Uh, only 17 of them in North America, most of them in the Southwest, and none in Pennsylvania prior to this getting here. What these do is they actually pierce the stems of trees, the stems of vines or other plants, and they remove phloem. So they don't feed on fruit, they don't chew leaves, they basically pierce an actu the actual plant and uh, remove phloem from it. It is native to Southeast Asia. You can see here that uh, the entire United States really is at risk from these. Because as you can see the range in Asia, it includes areas of China, Bangladesh, Vietnam. It was also introduced into South Korea, first detected there in 2006. And by 2009, it had spread all over South Korea. Now, to put that in context, South Korea is just a little bit smaller than the entire state of Pennsylvania. So right now, after three years of it being here, we're still in a few southeastern counties. So a lot of the work that the local community has done there has really helped to keep this from going a lot further than it could, uh, which is what South Korea experienced. In South Korea, it was immediately called an invasive species, and they immediately started seeing damage to commodities such as grapes and peaches. Where we stand here in Pennsylvania, and you'll see this is one of our most up-to-date maps. Uh, it does actually include some points that are maybe not yet in the quarantine, uh, because we do that monthly. Dana is going to talk about that in depth. But you can see the spread is actually still relatively contained compared to the fact that in South Korea, it was all over the whole country. And this is where we currently sit in Pennsylvania. So for those uh, who can't see my small writing, the green dots represent negative survey points, and the red dots represent points that we have actually detected the insect. Now, Tree of Heaven is the preferred host of spotted lanternfly. Spotted lanternfly will make use of almost any plant. Uh, the actual recorded host list from its native range is approximately 78 species, and there are over 70 species we have documented on it uh, to make use of here in Pennsylvania. As you can see, Tree of Heaven is found all over the country, and so there is a potential for its uh, favorite host food uh, to help it spread to other places, uh, other even larger growing areas in Pennsylvania. Tree of Heaven is generally characterized by having almost smooth gray bark and by having compound leaves, which you can see here. And when you break those leaves, it has a very foul odor. Uh, this is also an invasive species. Uh, this species is a weed tree that, if you cut it down, will sprout several from the rootstock the next year. So it presents some additional challenges when you go to control. Now, the impact of spotted lanternfly was uh, unknown when it first got here. We had reports from Korea that it was damaging grapes and peaches, and, but the real damage uh, started to show up um, pretty heavily this year. And so basically what you can think of is as the spotted lanternfly feeds on a plant, it doesn't use all the phloem that it drinks. 
and it ends up ejecting a substance called honeydew, and this is essentially sugar water. You can see it here trickling down a grape leaf. This will eventually develop into sooty mold. This causes the plant to die back and the leaves to fall off and may also represent um, basically a loss of growth in the crop. Uh, you can see it here pictured on grapes, hops, and uh, what, what I'm going to show you next is a video taken by a student uh, named Erica Smyers who works for Dr. Julie Urban who's with us today. And this, uh, this really, I want you to really notice on this one, if I can find my cursor. So as you're seeing this video play, you will see honeydew being ejected by these insects. And these are grapes that are very close to harvest. These grapes had been treated, and that's the scary part, is even though you can treat for them, uh, occasionally they can come in and impact a crop, and you can see the one in the middle shooting honeydew all over everything. It isn't them necessarily feeding on fruit, but coating all the fruit in honeydew that will make it unmarketable. And in fact, in Korea, they have all kinds of strategies to deal with this. One of them, and their most successful one, includes bagging the grapes themselves. And uh, I actually grew up in northeast Pennsylvania, which is a grape town. You will not be able to bag the grapes in northeast Pennsylvania. It's not economically feasible. So. Just, uh, just to show you the sort of numbers that we experienced this year. Other impacts this year. So previous years we had a lot of reports on silver maple, some on walnut, but this year we got damage reported to sweet basil, cucumber, blueberry, um, horseradish. One grower even uh, documented that he actually chose to treat his horseradish, which he has never had to do before, which is kind of unusual as well. Um, we had another farmer turn in impacts on alfalfa, soy, and corn. Now, as to whether or not these are actually impacting them, they are definitely showing up in the crops. Uh, the gentleman who sent me this photo claimed he suffered 30% loss in yield on his alfalfa. Uh, so we will be watching that very closely. That's a little alarming, actually. What I noticed personally and what others have reported this year was a major shift, which we did not experience in years previous, to our hardwoods industry, where those were always at risk because this is a, an active hitchhiker on hardwoods, um, and we had noticed them feeding on other trees in previous years. We had not noticed damage. This year, we noticed major flagging and dieback on the terminals of black walnut, northern red oak, shagbark hickory, and also maple. And so uh, this time, we don't know exactly what that means, but we have been working with our Bureau of Forestry folks to assess just what a threat this is going to be to them. One thing I really want you to take notice of is looking at the understory underneath where they're feeding, where you see all of the young uh, sprouts being coated in honeydew. These will eventually uh, develop sooty mold and die back. Uh, this is a picture of a black walnut during a training in the middle of summer where you can see a lot of the leaves turning yellow and starting to die back. And it goes all the way up the tree. It's not just right in front of your eyes. Um, the other impacts that basically affect everybody and that we get the most calls about are those that affect people. And so uh, we're very keenly aware of this. Uh, I study insects, insects don't bother me, but if you are even slightly afraid of an insect, I can understand being extremely alarmed coming out to your backyard where your toddler's swing is hanging on your black cherry tree and seeing this. This is enough to catch anyone's attention. And you can see this is a well-used play area. Underneath that play area is going to be now all coated with honeydew from the feeding from these insects. And so everything that you see there will end up getting sooty mold on it. it is it's a really severe problem for those who have no tolerance for insects. Many people have called me and told me my quality of life is impacted. I don't feel comfortable going outside in my own backyard. And so that's where we are with what the impacts are. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the pest. I'm going to go sort of quick here to keep us on time. In Pennsylvania, we believe there will be one generation in a year. And what that means is throughout the winter, they will go through the winter as egg masses. They will hatch out starting sometime in late April, but mostly in May. Throughout the summer months, they will be immature, as we refer to these as instars. The first three are black with white spots, and a lot of people think they resemble ticks. These you will find on just about any kind of plant. So 
towards the fourth or last immature stage, they will start developing bright red patches, and they will start making a move towards uh, certain plant species at this time of year, uh, the most preferred one being Tree of Heaven. Around mid-July, they will start transforming into adults. They will mate uh, and then spread out and start laying eggs right about this time of year. So mid to late October is when the peak egg mass laying happens. Uh, egg masses uh, contain 30 to 50 eggs, and they're attached to almost anything you can think of. So a barn plank, uh, a rusty metal barrel, a rusty box car sitting along a railroad track, anything like this can actually be a good depository site for an egg mass. Uh, this is a great post in a local vineyard, and this is a standing dead tree where I've removed some bark on the other side there. And you can see they hide them as, as best they can as well. Uh, so any property owner, actually, who can find their egg masses and can reach them can actually impact the population on their property fairly significantly by simply removing them. And this is just, you can use a twig, you can use scraper cards, which we've provided for you today, and you just scrape in a downward motion into a container and, and discard it. Uh, and this can actually have quite an impact on the population on a small level, and anyone can do this. So we've been encouraging this since the first year. Uh, immatures actually have, uh, in response to light, uh, the need to crawl up a tree every day. And you can use brown sticky paper bands uh, wrapped around a tree to eliminate some of them from your property as well. It's not a silver bullet, but it removes a little bit, and it's probably what helped keep them in check uh, a little better than what Korea was able to keep them in check. A lot, we had a lot of volunteers uh, offer to do this on their own property, and we supplied the stuff, and they were able to get through it pretty well. Males and females, um, unfortunately, will mate multiple times. The reason that is important is because most successful insect eradication programs really, uh, rely on the release of sterile male popula into the population. Uh, and because they mate multiple times, that makes sterile male releases not a possibility. And so we, th we thought we would mention that just to let you know, we actually have explored many different ways to try to wipe these out. Uh, but the fact that they mate multiple times means they can breed, and they can breed very well and reach very large numbers. Every single life stage is actually a threat for hitchhiking, as you can see here. Uh, we believe the two biggest risks are the adults this time of year, right before they lay eggs. Uh, you can see this adult attempting to crawl into an open window of a vehicle and also by the de uh, deposition of egg masses. We believe that's how they actually originally got here, as egg masses on some type of a trade product. It doesn't really matter if the product's treated or not. If it is stored outside where you have a population of these, egg masses laid on a product are able to move, and they are able to survive a pretty long journey, like all the way from Asia to here. Uh, so you can picture an egg mass being laid on a train, uh, you know, like a train car, this could end up in California in a few days. And so we, we're looking at all the pathways very seriously, but the, the two we are focusing on the, the most are, of course, the adults and the egg masses. I wanted to show you this, that this can actually be a real challenge. You can be very careful with your personal biosecurity. That means you can check your car to make sure you don't have any. But in a situation like this, and I hope you can make these out, uh, Numbers of this insect can get so high that it is very difficult to open a car door without two or three of them flying in with you. And so uh, everybody being careful in the core zone has really, uh, we really credit that with uh, curtailing the spread to some degree. Uh, but this, these are kind of alarming numbers and you can see just how difficult it is for people who live there uh, to try to help us out with this. Um, so the program relies a lot on cooperation and is basically uh, based on an IPM strategy. And IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. So we learn a lot about the biology, we place tools that are available to us on the table, we make a decision on those, and then we, we implement them. And so this is really what's happened over the last three years. We've used um, the help of a lot of local officials, uh, state agencies, and of course um, our our research partners in the university system, including Kutztown, Penn State, uh, East Stroudsburg University, even North Carolina State, and some others have uh, joined and helped provide some answers to questions that we had. 
Uh, the USDA has been uh, an excellent partner here, uh, helping us develop strategies, and they continue to work on these. And as new things become available, we will certainly implement them and make sure people are aware of them. Uh, we use uh, hired crews uh, through Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. The USDA has chipped in uh, a ground force this season to help us as well. And we also use volunteers, property owners, local municipalities, business owners have all actually really cooperated very well uh, to help us try to deal with this. Oh, did that again. Um, so, I'll just give you some, some brief numbers. Um, so, we actually have uh, had volunteers mostly, and our crews banned almost 10,000 trees since 2014, and that's killed about a million of uh, spotted lanternfly. Egg mass scraping is very impactful. Uh, we've had about 1,600,000 1, of those killed. Uh, but ha what has been uh, really good here is uh, the actual appearance of the insect leads to great public outreach and response. Uh, so one of the things is uh, I'm used to getting maybe 3,000 calls in 10 years. Since August 1st, we have received 18,000 calls into our public report line. And of those, 98% of them have been accurate. Uh, the percentage for the other 3,000 calls in the last 10 years doesn't even achieve 1%. So this is a, a very good insect for letting people help you with it. And that's what we have chosen to do. And it, it really has helped us to direct what resources we have to new positives. The main control method, though, that we use outside of outreach and the mechanical methods that everybody can do is actual property, property level control. And what that means is we will do limited host removal. So we'll remove most of its favorite food source, which is Tree of Heaven and then establish a few of them as what we refer to as trap trees. These are treated with insecticides. Think of this as a one acre plot of land and the light green trees being every other tree on the property and think of the dark green trees as being tree of heaven. So in this method you remove most of its favorite food source and then you treat the ones that are remaining with an insecticide. Uh, we use dinotefuran for this. Right around mid-July, it, uh, it has been demonstrated many times that even though they'll use every other tree, around July they seem to need to take a meal from Tree of Heaven to complete their life cycle. And even if they can complete it on other things, they will go out of their way to find this tree. And so this really helps you concentrate the insecticide so that you're not spraying it all over the place and killing every other thing. This helps you target the pest. And this has actually been fairly effective when done well. Uh, basically, the trap trees attract them in, and the insecticide in the trap trees kills them. And the impacts were actually quite stunning year one, and that has continued into year two. Uh, again, though, this is a difficult thing. Uh, it's a difficult thing to teach a property owner. It's a difficult thing for folks to understand sometimes. But when done well, you actually do end up with a fair amount of kill. And properties where we have done this for two to three years, we've seen massive uh, reductions in basically band counts the following year. And so we do know it's working, but it has to happen on a much larger scale than what we've been able to accomplish. Right now, we know we have 1,462 properties that we need to get to. And we're not, unfortunately, we're not fast enough when we recognize that. And so um, glad you have us here to be able to present all of this. and. Uh, talk about this a little bit today. Um, most of our spread that we've noticed is linked to hitchhiking. It's not really natural spread. So everything the community has done to help keep this in the quarantined area has been a huge help because when it does get out, it is basically by human-assisted hitchhiking. Um, last thing, though, is just when you think you have it figured out, it does something new. Um, Prior to one month ago, I had received zero reports on Apple, only to have Erica Smyers, uh, the grad student working, send me this video. And this, this was a new behavior. They had not actually attacked Apple prior to a month ago. And this is alarming. This would be alarming to any grower. Uh, we responded to this by engaging the, the entomologists at the fruit research station in uh, Penn State, and they're developing control plans as we speak. Uh, but this just goes to show you that the insect, as it reaches a new area, will start to do new things, and we need to be ready to adapt as well. And so with that, I believe I'm going to be turning you over to Dana.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I want everyone to understand what's at risk currently. And what we have up here on the screen now for you are values that we know about some of our commodities. For our forest products, we are the number one exporter of hardwoods in the United States. For grapes, apples, and peaches, and nursery, we rank in the top five. So we have a lot of ag commodities that we know would be affected. And that's not just that the insect would um, attack them, but it could be trade. Our international trade could be impacted, as well as our interstate trade. We have values that we can't put on some of the resources we have in Pennsylvania. Our tourism. We are third in the nation with our state parks, just behind California and Alaska. So we have a lot of tourism coming. We are a hunter's paradise. We are a fisherman's paradise. Those would all be at threat should the spotted lantern fly remain unchecked. Um, Excuse me, can we, you pull your microphone closer so we can get, can't hear you real well. Is this better? Thank you. Sorry, I'm not usually this quiet. I'm usually told to be quiet. Um, we have new business initiatives that are moving forward uh, to help um, promote um, Port of Philadelphia. We have lumber um, that will be going through that port. Um, we have ports that have shut down lumber exports, like Baltimore and Virginia, because of methyl bromide treatments. And the Port of Philadelphia is looking to um, take the lead in lumber exports for us at that point. We have the new PA Preferred Brew, where we would like to promote growing hops and grains in Pennsylvania. Hops would be severely impacted by spotted lanternfly. To me, negative data is a wonderful thing. This is what I present to our other states, and this is what is presented to countries that we do trading with. Uh, the negative points show where it is not in Pennsylvania and that those commodities are good to go. And a lot of the states would look at this as well. They see that we are actively looking and surveying and that we have taken this threat seriously. And so they would be willing to allow well, for the commodities to come from Erie, so the grapes would still be able to trade. Uh, Adams County apples would still be good to go and move out. Um, and our feed mills that are scattered throughout, those products would still be able to, to move throughout. And of course, our hardwoods. <clears throat> when we are looking at quarantine, uh, sometimes you'll see on maps, you'll see random points that may be outside of what our current quarantine area is. And Sven mentioned this, when we are looking at those, they may just be in what we refer to as a regulatory incident, where it was just one. We do an extensive survey when we find one, and if we find it's just the one insect, we consider that an incident, and so we would not quarantine that area. But when we find an established population, that's when a quarantine is placed in that area. What the quarantine does, it covers all living life stages of the insect whether it's the nymphs, the adult, or the egg masses. That means it cannot move out of the quarantine area. And this is to prevent um, unnatural spread or human-assisted spread. We limit the movement of commodities and home articles, but we do not stop it. We ask people to take a look, take that moment, inspect it, make sure that you're not having an egg mass. And if you do, remove it before it moves out of the area. For our residents that live in the quarantine area, we have a checklist that they are provided that they can um, go through, do the inspection themselves, sign the paperwork. It becomes a legal document for them to then move uh, the grill that they may have sold on Craigslist so that they're able to take it out, or the RV that they want to take uh, to the camping locations, they're able to move it out of the quarantine once it's inspected. For our businesses, we establish uh, phytosanitary certificates, uh, which are issued by our inspectors, and also compliance agreements. So we have ways to help businesses who are in the quarantine area. Again, we're slowing the spread, or slowing the spread by using uh, that moment in time for inspections and outreach to the community. Lumber harvest still can be pursued within the quarantine area. 
and many of the townships and boroughs may have per, uh, lumber permits that they issue, and they work with us very closely so that we're aware of all the people who are working within uh, the quarantine area so we can educate them, we can inspect the sites, and we have a safe product moving out so, again, we can continue our interstate and international trade. Why do we have the quarantine? It's the insect. It's all about the insect and what it can potentially do to Pennsylvania, what the economic impact it will bring to us. If it goes to hops, Sven showed you the honeydew. Well, the honeydew going on the flowers, the crop is not viable. The grapes, it can reduce sugar production. Then you have Welches who can't produce the grape juice that they're well known for. Uh, the, the sooty mold and the <clears throat> honeydew that is secreted. Who wants to walk through a forested area when everything is raining down on you? And when you talk to the residents, they will tell you it is like walking in rain uh, when you are walking through the forest. Um, and then the sooty mold takes over and makes that lovely under foliage black. When you walk outside, who wants to see a tree covered in the insects from top to bottom. After a few years, this will impact the quality of the hardwoods. They are sucking the life out of the hardwoods when they are on those trees. It reduces our quality. This would be an ideal setting. If everything was on a small scale, we had only small families uh, harvesting their grapes or picking the apples, that's a wonderful thing to think about. This is what it really is. You have orchards that have crates lined up in their fields when they are in harvest. So they are at risk there. They may not um, do damage to the apples, but they're in the crates. They may lay egg masses on the crates. They have to be inspected. They have to be safeguarded. That takes time and labor uh, for the businesses to do that. You have open bed trucks where you have grapes being deposited. Again, the threat is there. Um, the area in Berks County has major highways running all through it. We have large warehouses. We have large trucking companies. Woody debris. We remember what happened with Sandy and how much material we had to handle. We know we have flooding in Pennsylvania, winter storms. All that woody debris has to be managed to make sure there are no egg masses moving with any of that debris. Types of businesses in the quarantine, they're not just all agricultural businesses. Yes, we have lots of landscapers and garden centers and nurseries within the area, as well as Christmas tree farms. But we also have some non-traditional companies as well. People who handle tanks for hydrogen and oxygen gases. We have a pharmaceutical company that is in the midst of the quarantine, and they have taken all the steps that they can to try and safeguard their facility. Should one insect get into that facility while they are doing a pharmaceutical run, they have to shut everything down, throw away all the product that they have produced, re-sanitize, and start all over again. Others that can be impacted, think about our fares. You know, insects flying all over, do you really want, you know, that's not kind of a nice thing to think about when we're out doing our fares. Um, and festivals, tailgating at Penn State, Philadelphia Eagles, the Pittsburgh Steelers. That would impact those people who are attending. Also, they're open stadiums. So again, they're sitting in the midst of, of these insects coming around them. Um, our dairy trucks, they have to be sanitized before the milk product has gone into them. If they have egg masses on the outside, then we have to find a food safe product that can remove the egg mass and still let our milk trucks do their job. Feed mills, we have them all through Pennsylvania. And if this insect were to get into the, while they're producing a feed, they have to flush the feed, start all over again. Um, chickens, we have layers. Um, if we have um, information from Korea and China, I believe that Birds who actually eat these insects will regurgitate them, so it's not pleasant for them. Um, Harley-Davidson, 
you know, you think that's really not an agricultural product, but they ship in crates on wood packing, so they're wood packing material. If one of the bikes were sitting outside or they got into the warehouse, egg masses could be laid under the wheel base of a, uh, of a motorcycle or, or a Holland tractor. So we have to think about those things. They will lay on anything. It's not just ag commodities. <clears throat> People living in the quarantine and what they're dealing with. We've heard stories of raining down you know, from the honeydew. Hunters can be impacted. Where do they put their tree stands? Up in a tree. They could be covered in egg masses or honeydew or black sooty mold by the time they get to them. People are not able to just walk in the parks anymore where there are high populations. We had a story of a daycare um, where the director is not able to let the children go outside and play because the populations are too high or she has to have them treated and they have AstroTurf, so she has to take the vacuum cleaner out before she can allow the children to go outside. So the quality of life for everyone in the quarantine will be affected. We try and work with businesses. We educate them. We do a risk assessment. If they don't have any Alanthus trees and it's a solid parking lot, they may have, have a very little risk associated with movement. There are some that have Alanthus trees all over the place, or they have tractor trailers that come in and out all of the time. Um, they have workers that don't live in the quarantine, so the threat of movement from a car being parked in their parking lot and going home is, is a real threat. So we have to go in, we do these risk assessments, we train the employees, and we try and do a case-by-case -case analysis so that we can um, work with the business and set up the most efficient way to manage and for them to be in compliance. This is a team effort. We need to have the community, which we have had from the very beginning. Um, this is not our first um, quarantine pest that we've had in Pennsylvania, but I can tell you this is the one that has gotten the community support. We've not had this before. The local elected officials have been right there with us to help promote and, and give the outreach. We need to continue that. We have advisory board calls for the elected officials and sister agencies and um, other like conservation groups for those that are in the quarantine so that we can give them updates and we can find out what the concerns are and the questions are that they are facing. We have developed electronic messaging that we are happy to share with anyone um, within the quarantine area and we are looking to promote that even more as we move forward. Trainings and business visits, it's all part of the process. And working with USDA, our universities, extension, local effect, uh, officials, and with our community is the only way we are gonna manage to get through this and be successful in suppression and eradication. Thank you. Thank you both very much. This time we'll have Matthew Rhodes, Executive Director of the Plant Health Program, USDA, uh, give his testimony. Sure, you can hear me. Okay. Um, Chairpersons Vogel, Schwank, uh, Causer, and Pashinsky, uh, uh, members of uh, both the House and Senate Ag Committees, um, and other distinguished uh, members, um, thank you for inviting the United States Department of Agriculture to come speak with you today. Um, my name is Matt Rhodes. I'm the Executive Director uh, for Policy Management in USDA's um, Plant Protection and Quarantine Program. Um, also attending the, the hearing with me today, or the meeting today, are John Crow, our acting um, um, director of pest detection and emergency programs, and Timothy Newcamp, the state plant health director um, for plant protection and quarantine um, in Pennsylvania. Um, we look forward to answering any questions later on. Um, PPQ's mission is to safeguard U.S. agriculture and natural resources against the entry, establishment, and spread of economically and environmentally significant pests, and to facilitate safe trade in agricultural products. 
We welcome the opportunity to share what we're doing about Spotted Lanternfly and hope to help you better understand the nature of our collaboration with P Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture in addressing this pest. Um, I'd like to start off first by saying I'm a native Pennsylvanian. Um, I grew up in Berks County. I went to Boyertown High School. So um, my family's right in the middle of this, uh, uh, this situation. Um, so while I'm representing the, the federal government here today, I have a strong personal interest in this as well. Last night I received a text from my dad with pictures of his maple tree in his front yard coated with spotted lantern fly with the simple message, better get to work. So, um, um, Which is yeah. my hometown, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, Representative Maloney, um, nice to see you here. And um, um, we share a common interest in trying to address this issue. Unfortunately. Yes, absolutely. Um, PPQ remains concerned about spotted lanternfly, especially as the pest population has grown significantly this year. It's been found in new areas, and we've, we've observed it feeding on uh, valuable specialty crops, including apples and, and grapes. I'd like to start with a little background, too, on, on PPQ. We're part of USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. And as I mentioned earlier, our mission is to safeguard U.S. agriculture and facilitate safe trade. To accomplish the safeguarding part of our mission, um, we, we focus our work in two specific areas, preventing pests from entering and establishing in the United States and then combating pests that, that enter the U.S. once they arrive um, or, and are introduced. This, this work spans a wide spectrum of activities, including offshore programs, permitting, port and border inspection, pest identification and mitigation, smuggling interdiction and trade compliance, as well as pest detection, response, uh, management and eradication programs. In addition to our safeguarding mission, PPQ facilitates safe trade in, in three ways. We promote the use of science-based international and regional trade standards to eliminate unfair or unjustified phytosanitary trade barriers. We expand and maintain current export markets and open new ones by resolving plant health barriers to trade. And three, we, we certify the health of U.S. exports to make sure that the United States is presenting clean products to our trading partners so that we meet our trading partners' import requirements. When a pest like spotted lanternfly gets in, we work with state departments of agriculture and industry to respond. This includes surveying the area uh, surrounding a new pest detection to determine the extent of the infestation, gathering information about the pest biology, hosts, and how it will most likely spread, as well as assessing its p potential environmental and economic impact, among other factors. We often convene technical working groups comprised of federal, state, and academic experts to address key questions about new pests. When we determine that a, a reproducing population of a new pest is present in the United States, PPQ cooperates with the affected states to determine an appropriate course of action. This ranges from establishing st state or federal programs to control or eradicate, establishing quarantines to slow the spread, providing information and technical support to affected individuals and organizations are taking no action, depending on the circumstances. Before we can set a specific program goal, whether that's to eradicate, contain, suppress, or slow the pest spread, we have to understand the risk posed by the pest, um, especially to our country's ag or natural resources, markets, economy, um, and, and we must also determine what tools are available to control or eradicate the pest, including chemical treatments, biological controls, host removal, other measures. I want to make it clear that PPQ is committed to taking the least drastic action, but the most effective option for managing these risks presented by a new pest. In some cases, especially when there's a lack of evidence of the pest will cause widespread harm or no imminent threat of foreign restrictions on U.S. exports, the best option for regulating a pest is to let the state take the lead, which is what we've done more or less to date with spotted lanternfly. In the case of spotted lanternfly, after its initial detection, PPQ convened a technical working group composed of PPQ state and university scientists, which gathered all the available information about spotted lanternfly and produced recommendations for survey and control methods. To better inform our response, PPQ scientists visited Asian countries where spotted lanternfly is native to learn about the pest behavior and natural enemies. Also following recommendations from our technical working group, we elected to provide PDA 
uh, funding to survey for the pest and control it using a combination of pesticide treatments, herbicide treatments, and tree removals, all beginning in 2014. Uh, since 2014, PPQ has provided $5.5 million in funding to PDA to support efforts to control spotted lanternfly. While a portion of that funding supports P PDA staff who conduct surveys for spotted lanternfly, the, uh, the, the majority of that funding um, has been used to pay for spotted lanternfly treatments and tree removals. Um, We've provided approximately $1.4 million over three years for methods development eff efforts by USDA's Agriculture Research Service, uh, universities including Kutztown, Pennsylvania, uh, Penn State, um, um, the Department of Conservation Natural Resources in Pennsylvania, and our own scientists. Three areas of methods development where we're focused right now is developing lures so to more accurate, enable more accurate early monitoring of spotted lanternfly, biological control methods, and optimizing chemical treatments. Regarding specific outreach efforts, we've supported PDA and Pennsylvania Extension Service by providing nearly $150,000 to optimize communication to industry and homeowners. Uh, we funded, um, helped to support much of the efforts that you've seen from PDA um, in terms of the, their outreach efforts, uh, outreach materials, supporting uh, town hall meetings and other communications. And this summer we provided uh, a dozen federal staff to supplement PDA staff on the ground, um, conducting survey around the outer edges of the existing infested area. Um, to help us better define the leading edge of the infestation, altogether bringing USDA's total investment in this pest program to $7.5 million. Given the large population of spotted lanternfly adults that we've observed in southeastern Pennsylvania this year, PPQ and Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture reconvened our technical working group in late September of this year to review the current situation and recommend strategies, adjustments to the program, as well as resource requirements that are needed for managing the extent of the infestation that we're experiencing. Based on the technical working group's findings, we reaffirmed that the best tools available to control spotted lanternfly are, in fact, pesticide and herbicide treatments of hosts, as well as tree removals to the extent that tree removals are cost effective. It's a key tool in the toolbox. We try to balance the use of the tools that are in the toolbox so as to make the money go as far as possible. Um, the, the technical working group reaffirmed that Alanthus altissima is spotted lanternfly's preferred host and it likely needs to return to Alanthus at some point in its, to complete its life cycle. But we also pointed out the need for a more comprehensive host list. There are a lot of unknowns remaining about how this pest may behave. We've learned this year that its behaviors changed from year to year, as Fenn and Dana's presentations pointed out. Um, the situation has changed in terms of what, what hosts um, um, the spotted lanternfly seeks out uh, under changing circumstances as it becomes acclimated to this environment. Uh, the technical working group also recommended PPQ complete ongoing work to develop an effective lure to aid in delimitation and um, detection surveys for spotted lanternfly. Specific lure will provide a better tool to help measure population densities in different parts of the state. The working group also recommended that we continue to explore options for biological control, which may provide a long-term solution for helping to manage or reduce populations. However, development of effective biological control methods often takes a decade or more, so this is not a quick fix. During our last meeting with Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture on October 6th, policy meeting that we had to talk about strategy, we discussed how the strategy for managing the pest should change in light of the latest information from the technical working group, especially considering weekly reports of detections of spotted lanternfly farther and farther from the previously established quarantine boundaries, outside of those boundaries. While the particulars of the strategy and estimated resource needs to support the strategy are not final at this point, we hope to have them clarified very, very shortly, in a matter of days. Um, we are, um, in the meantime, still continuing to recommend that we re redirect the vast majority of program resources to the leading edge of the infestation. This approach will allow us to prevent further spread and contain the pests so that we can suppress the overall population. 
This approach is not without its challenges, um, given the potential for the pest to hitchhike on conveyances originating in infested areas. So to the extent that resources are available to reduce populations in the core of the infested area, um, that will be extremely helpful in protecting the human-assisted spread of the pest as well. But our priority at this point is to detect and delimit the leading edge of the infestation and apply appropriate control methods to knock back that population in an attempt to stop further natural spread. One of PPQ's key roles is to manage the trade implications of new pests. We have been and will continue to actively work with affected industries in Pennsylvania to minimize economic impacts associated with state or trading partner actions. Fortunately, no states or foreign trading partners have adopted restrictions on articles moving out of areas quarantined for spotted lanternfly to date. However, restrictions are possible, additional restrictions by both states and trading partners as they all learn more, as we are learning more about the nature of this infestation and the damage caused by spotted lanternfly, the cost of complying with any additional requirements, whether by trading partners or by other states, um, is really unknown at this point, but has the potential to be significant. PPQ is here today to demonstrate our commitment to collaboration with PDA and other cooperators to control, and we hope at some point eradicate spotted lanternfly. We very much appreciate the efforts of PDA to address this challenging new pest. Thank these committees for inviting us to discuss the work still ahead. Thank you again for your time. I look forward to answering any questions you have. Thank you, Matt. At this time we have Emily Swackhammer, a horticultural extension educator from uh, Montgomery County. Well, good morning. <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity, and thank you for making this available to a wider audience through distance technology. I was asked to talk about resident concerns, green industry concerns, and then summarize some of the uh, work that Penn State Extension and research has been doing in the last year. This is a picture of an Alanthus altissima tree in one of the areas that's been heavily infested with spotted lanternfly for three years. We are starting to see tree death in this species, so we don't really know how this is going to have a long-term effect on other timber species, but we are seeing dead trees. I had a video in here, but since we're not connected to the internet, you can search for um, honeydew raining out of Alanthus trees on YouTube, and you can find it. Um, but Sven, Sven showed you some uh, footage of that, so I'll skip through some of these. Some of my slides kind of overlap with Sven's a little bit. This is the typical circle of honeydew and sooty mold that you get around trees. And one thing that the other speakers didn't mention is the smell that ensues. So it smells like a really bad fermentation experiment or putrid compost pile. Another unattractive feature of this insect. This is a picture of a resident that has a river birch growing above their, their deck, and it's Trex decking, which is the plastic, recycled plastic. And you can see the accumulation of sooty mold and honeydew. It makes the decks really slippery, and it's very hard to clean this off of this kind of decking material. So it's another impact of this insect that has cost and safety features associated with it. I'm showing here some of the stinging insects that are collecting the honeydew from the insects, and these properties are just buzzing with stinging insects. So if you have somebody that's allergic um, in your family, another uh, feature that is not welcome in landscapes. This is a property that um, had a lot of insects swarming to the houses. So they tend to like to go to tall structures. I've noticed it on uh, silos on farms, um, houses that have prominent like southern exposures. The insects will swarm to these houses. They like the warmth. The public doesn't understand the difference that this insect isn't trying to get in your house and eat it. So it's not a wood pest. 
It's also not a pest that will try to overwinter in the walls of your homes like our other invasive insect, the brown marmorated stink bug. But this does cause great concern. So there's an educational need here for people. You see the power cord on this um, patio. This family is using a shop vac to clean their deck every day. This is a picture of a local church. And um, I took this picture after one hour of accumulation of insects. And they have had increased maintenance costs because you know, they have events and weddings and things, and they have to pay someone to come in and continually sweep these insects away. Um, this feature of the insect with um, interacting with buildings has led to some high pressure sales coming through the area. Uh, certain companies that are going door to door canvassing businesses and not really dispensing correct information about potential for damage to structures. And I'm getting calls about that as well. So there's a lot of education needed in this area. Um, Sven showed you this bench already. So um, I think I'll just skip through. But uh, the point is that if people want to share things or move lawn furniture, there's a lot of potential for it to spread. Firewood is a big concern. A lot of people heat with firewood. The heating season's coming up. Imagine how difficult it is to inspect the firewood that you want to take out of the quarantine area to give to your nephew or something like that. It's, it's just a really um, big problem and has a lot of potential for it to uh, spread that way. Another area that I have noticed concern about uh, revolves around auctions. We have a lot of auctions in Pennsylvania. This was a family where the patriarch was deceased and they were liquidating a lot of the equipment. And the family did the best they could, but a lot of this equipment was sitting outside in an infested area. And I went there early in the morning and found evidence that the family had tried to scrape egg masses off of these objects. This was a snow plow. And you can see just the, like the imprint of where that destroyed egg mass was. So I was very glad to see that. People are really trying. But if you're in the middle of an auction situation, it's sort of, you know, there's so many other emotions and things going on with a family in this situation. It's um, just another added pressure on those families. So there are concerns of residents, and I, I tried to lump them into categories. Certainly, they're concerned about the quality of their life. Um, the picture shows a family that has some pet livestock under trees, and these animals are coated in honeydew and sooty mold. They were sticky and moldy all summer long. People are concerned about the safety. There's a lot of education needed to help people understand that the spotted lanternfly won't bite them, but they're still afraid of them in a lot of cases. But there are a lot of concerns about pesticide safety and a lot of education needed in that area. People are also concerned about pollinator health in relation to pesticide use. Of course, they're concerned about their tree health, and the residents are concerned about agricultural production. I hear that all the time from the people I talk to. They're concerned for the, their neighbors that are apple producers or vineyards. They're concerned about the costs. I've had people um, really concerned about their property values, how this might affect that. Um, and the cost of pesticide applications and tree removal, people can't afford that sort of thing in some cases. And then they're concerned about compliance. A lot of people are trying to do the best they can, but they're also concerned that there's a lot of people that are not aware of the quarantine or the insect at all. And that creates tension in the community. I wanted to speak for the green industry just a little bit. That's a, a commodity group that I do most of my extension work with. This is a picture of a specimen white birch tree in a landscape, and it's covered with thousands of spotted lanternfly egg masses. So this is a specimen tree. These are expensive to replace. People really you know, are attached to them. Um, and if this tree would succumb to spotted lanternfly damage, it, it's, you know, it's a personal loss for that family. Landscapers are also asking about potential health effects on trees and po the possibility that this insect could spread diseases. We have not um, observed that, but we noticed this white accumulation around the base of many trees, and 
We don't really know what that is yet, so it's an area that needs more research, and we have a new graduate student at Penn State that's going to be addressing what are these molds? How might they affect the health of the tree? Could this be a, a slime flux kind of organism that would discolor the timber? And also um, the components of the spores that might be being spread, and if that has a potential effect on human health. So these are all other questions. I put a picture of um, spotted lanternfly on container nursery stock in here just to um, illustrate that the nurseries are doing the best they can. They're trying to become in compliance with the quarantine or the compliance agreement and um, the phytosanitary certificates, but it's, it's awfully hard when you have the insects moving around your garden center like this. So the green industry, of course, is concerned about tree health. They're concerned about customer satisfaction. A lot of people are calling green industry professionals looking for uh, tree care uh, pesticide applications. And we need more research to be able to identify what is a research-based effective recommendation using the least toxic option. So they would be able to satisfy their customers with those uh, available practices. The effect on their businesses, I've had a lot of green industry people say that they're flooded, inundated with phone calls, and they have hired additional staff to try to just continually answer these questions. Some of the green industry businesses have been expanding to provide services for these people. And um, of course, they're concerned about regulations, the cost of additional inspections that are required, and also about pesticide rec regulations. So I put this slide together to try to summarize some of the work that Penn State Extension has been doing in 2017. We have two educators, myself and another uh, one, Dr. Amy Corman, who really has been doing most of this work in the southeast part of the state. Um, we've also been training our master gardener volunteers and our master watershed steward volunteers, and they've been very helpful with some of the phone call conversations. And we have the front office staff in six counties also thoroughly engaged in this process. So we had over 1,000 phone calls, visits, and emails, and I'm sure that's an underestimate. Um, everybody that's involved with Spotted Lanternfly knows the phones have been ringing off the hook. These are not short conversations. So if you look in your packets, I've, I've supplied our management calendar and also how to comply with the quarantine requirements. I believe you all should have that. And each phone conversation is basically summarizing Sven's talk and then covering the content in those two fact sheets. These conversations take a long time. So um, we've had you know, our volunteers trained up to do that, but we're going to need to have a lot more people staffing the phones across the state. We're delivering displays at events. I counted 39 this year. Um, we've done 30 presentations to 1,335 people. Uh, we've had news reports with a lot of the media. They've been very helpful in getting the word out to the public. And I counted the YouTube video hits um, from our on-demand. We have 10 videos that are up there, and um, you can see it's over 17,000. And that doesn't include where it's been shared on Facebook pages and um, also on Penn State's website. So just a specific example of um, one of these efforts. We had eight meetings for the public this spring in April. We had 204 people attend. It was a collaborative effort. You can see from Penn State, PDA, and Berks Conservation District. We had 144 people that gave us email addresses, and we surveyed them in October. 50 people returned their surveys. 98% of them said they reported that they taught at least 775 other people. So the, the public are working on this, this issue, and, and they're really reaching out. 52% said they killed spotted lanternfly on their properties. 16 reported that they killed 273 Atlantis trees on their properties, and that's at their own expense. This really does show that the public is trying. 11 trap trees were established that were reported to me, and I think that's a little bit out of reach for a lot of people, so we need more um, education, um, maybe some hands-on kind of workshops to help people um, do that if they wish. 
And then I'll just wrap it up with summarizing some of the research side of Penn State that's been going on. Um, we have some dedicated faculty and staff that have been working on projects. Um, we have two graduate students. I listed two extension educators, Amy Corman and I have been doing some of the, the research in the field, the applied stuff. And then there's a lot of collaboration going on. So we're looking for um, efficacy results research-based recommendations. Um, we're doing DNA analysis to determine where this insect actually came from, the exact location, and that would help us go there and look for beneficial insects that might help us in uh, biocontrol. Um, we mentioned earlier attractants and pheromones and how that might help in trapping them, and then the host range study is also ongoing and important. More of this will be going on. Um, we're always looking for the uh, comments from people to help direct what research can be done. Thank you. Thank you. At this time we have uh, Mary Ann Lieberman, owner of Maple Springs Vineyard, and uh, Calvin Beckman, owner of Beckman Orchards. Do you want me to, you want me to roll this? Uh -huh. I think it's just going to leave. Good morning. I really appreciate you all being here. I'm Mary Ann Lieberman. Um, I own Maple Springs Vineyard. Uh, I, before I start, I want to just say that I, yep, just closer. Oh, okay. Mary Ann Lieberman, Maple Springs Vineyard. Oh, that sounds better. Um, we uh, are at the epicenter of the quarantine. Uh, we were identified early on. I want to first of all compliment all of the professionals that you've heard today have all been on our property multiple times. Um, we have cooperated for the last three years and actually really appreciate uh, being a test site for everything that you've heard about today. Um, our concern right now is that with the banding of the trees, we are part of the program of inoculate or uh, treating the bait trees, removing the other trees uh, on 45 of our, our 80 acres. Um, we also do that program on our own, spend our own money doing that program. So despite uh, all of our efforts in the vineyard and on the perimeter of the vineyard, uh, I would say three years ago, I could take my flip-flop and control things uh, with all of our staff. Two years ago, um, I would say we'd have hundreds. This year, despite the best efforts of everybody in this room, we we're looking at hundreds of thousands. So we do, we are able to knock these down. So our operation, we have 11 acres under vine, we make about 2,000 cases of wine. We only make our wine with estate-grown grapes. Uh, we have about $1.5 million in investment in the vineyard and about $2.5 million investment in our winery. We attract about 4,000 people a year uh, to our vineyard. The, um, uh, the challenge within the vineyard is that we have the ability to control the uh, the populations are knocked down the populations, I should say, uh, with some products that have been, you know, Erica Snyder's working on, on them at Penn State and so on, uh, products with like venom. They will knock down hundreds of thousands and within a week, we have hundreds of thousands back in the vineyard. So I have a lot of concerns about the amount of treatments we have to do to control the population in the vineyard. Uh, two years ago, my concern was the dew and, and uh, the, the dew preventing photosynthesis. It takes six leaves to ripen a bunch of grapes and uh, those leaves were all glossed with dew. Um, now, and you saw some of the pictures and I've provided some takeaways as well, um, those plants are covered with so many uh, bugs that it's, they're feeding right on the, on the vine. And if we have a difficult winter, I have no idea what the damage is to those trunks at this point. So uh, while I appreciate the view of Mr. Rhodes of treating the perimeter, with the way that these um, 
bugs are turning into an absolute infestation at such a rate. I think uh, my goal today is to ask for more resources to address the science of the pest, the insecticides, the bioways to keep these things in check, um, to have a lot more science working on predators, potential predators, uh, and to uh, make sure that we are uh, in a bigger way knocking down the core of the, of the population. Calvin? Uh, I appreciate allowing me to come before we would hear. Thank you. Uh, I operate Beekman Orchards and Vineyards on the, in Pike Township, Boyertown, Pennsylvania. We farm 127 commercial acres of apples and 70 acres of French vinifera grapes. Uh, like Marianne has reiterated, I've seen from the day one that the first influx when we came into this, we could not really notice much damage. It was very well controllable. Uh, next year, eh, we had a little bit on the perimeters. Our regular commercial sprays and things helped control them. There was concerns that we ran into with customers that I deal with out of state and export about shipment as people started to get wind of this insect. Uh, third year, uh, again, more adults became excessive. Uh, PDA came up, spoke to us about their plan to r remove and treat Atlantis trees, came out, tug everything. Plan was never implemented. Uh, apparently out of funding is the case. I don't know. Uh, this year, it's a totally different story. It's a horror story. Uh, those videos you saw of those things flying in the air were to, was taken in my orchard. Uh, you, they've infiltrated in such large numbers that you cannot stop them. We are in the process right now of harvesting grapes. Uh, the fe excessive feeding on the plants, we have started before the adults came in on some Pinot Noir that went for champagne. I averaged four and a half ton to the acre. We are now harvesting into still wine grapes with the adults. Uh, the production has been diminished back to half a ton to a ton to the acre in some instances. The, there's photos that were forwarded on to you by Farm Bureau that some of these numbers. We've done an insecticide spray uh, in the vineyard. We did a count estimate of 350 insects under every plant. And Sven's numbers earlier, you know, they looked impressive. That's a, in my vineyard alone, that's two million of them I killed at one time. These things have uh, economically impacted the grapes the hardest. Uh, we are looking at a loss of 215 to 225 tons this year, which is a revenue value of over $400,000. It's also a revenue value to the states and the federal government in tax money of over $90,000. And we're just the beginning. There's damage, again, will these insects do to the plant? Are they gonna survive the winter? They have greatly diminished the photosynthesis capacity. Uh, they do not have energy to go into the winter as a strong plant to overwinter. The apples have not been quite as bad. Uh, they don't seem to feed on the apple itself as they do the grapes but we are noticing a lot of heavy infestation on terminal end growth, which is the end of the tree that is new, which produces the fruit buds and sets the buds for next year's crops. Uh, what the effects will be will not be known till next year. And the young trees that we are now planting in these new varieties as Honeycrisp, Fuji, and Gala are very hard to grow. It takes a lot of time to get them into the production area. And as these insects feed these, they will stop the growth of the tree and they will never make full maturity. So the impact on the apple side still has not been seen. The other economic side to this is gonna be the additional sprays that are incurred. Uh, 
they will average in the neighborhood of 5,000 every application uh, with possibly three to four. My other concerns come into that there is not a labeled material labeled for lantern fly. We were told to use imitated chlorine, carbaryl, and some of the others that are mentioned before you. Uh, we need to do something as far as getting a section 18 and some guidance and direction to where what can we legally use to keep this open and the economic portion of shipping to our counterparts. McDonald's is one of my largest customers in Michigan and this year we had a tough sell to be able to ship apples. We actually had to put them in our controlled atmosphere storage, bring it down if there was any, any lantern flies that were available or in there it will kill them and then we had to ship but even shipping became a problem just because there's so many of them flying in the air they'll attach to the trucks they do whatever so it's going to affect the trade and commerce I'm not sure where our exports overseas are going to go as that market is still opening and we're trying to explore these avenues I think that we need to look for avenues to biologically control these. Uh, we have asked for degree day modules. We have done those ourselves. We've done a lot of work to try and combat this, working with chemical companies and things. And we can control our side. It's the infiltration out of the woods and surrounding areas that aren't treated that we can't control. So two days later, you're back with the extreme problem. I'm an optimist and I have to be in my business and I was optimistic about this insect at first. I have serious concerns at this point and if it continues and at this point I don't know that next year that I will be in business. It's, it is that bad. So I appreciate uh, the time to come before you. Uh, the economic impact is going to be greatly impacted to everybody across the board, wineries, etc. So final comment on somebody who actually puts the, the grapes in the bottle. Um, we are tracking and have statistics that um, our nitrogen levels coming into our winery are unprecedented never seen anywhere in the industry in the world. Um, the, the, um, what the bugs are doing to the plants is coming into the winery and it's going to be very difficult for a winery to sustain. Um, I get frightened when I go to the gas station and see them all over the walls at the gas station with 18 wheelers and everything else. And uh, I, again, would really ask that uh, with the efforts you guys are making of learning about this, that we get to the business of getting some resources behind the science. Again, we need to know what to spray. There are no harvest intervals. We had to make up our minds on our own. Um, I, I like to say that I try to be as conservative as possible with all of our sprays, but we're dealing with an infestation and that, that, that puts a lot of responsibility on us. Um, and I really think we need some science behind finding these predators or other methods. Uh, I mentioned that uh, we do find that they go to our fans on our Jiffy Lube men, and we saw them up on the phone poles at the transformers. Maybe there's some opportunities to create vibrations that attract them or other scientific experimental things, but we need resources behind it. Um, again, I, I think it's going to be difficult if we don't get to the core of the problem to really contain the problem. Uh, we did have visitors from Erie uh, come to our vineyard last week. They're very, very concerned about what's coming their way. Um, so again, thank you very much for your time, all the support, and all the support from all the agencies and people that have been focused on this issue. One other comment I do want to make. Uh, there's four commercial growers in our area. I'm here representing them because it's the middle of our harvest season, and I felt it that important to take off today to be before you. And in the three years that this has been in the, our area, none of us 
have had a person from PDA actually stop in and physically ask us, what's going on in your orchard? What are you seeing? What's happening? And I know they're doing a lot of work, but we are economically impacted. We are in the epicenter. And if you don't ask, you're not going to know the information of what's going on. So uh, it's a concern we have from the growers that information needs to be shared, needs to, needs to be out there. Extension's a great way to do that, but if you don't stop and ask, you don't know. Be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. What I have uh, heard in the last hour and a half is very disturbing and very disheartening, I guess you could say. Uh, I've been reading about it and talking to Senator Swank about it, but uh, the impacts and what I've seen and heard here in the last hour and a half is uh, very disturbing to me as far as this goes, and obviously we did, do need to put a lot more effort in, into this as best we can, but uh, I'd like to other, ask the other panelists to sort of kind of come forward if they could, I guess, the best you can around the table here, and uh, then we'll just sort of kind of, anybody has any questions, why we can, we have about a half hour or so to ask questions here, so uh, you just limit your questions a little bit so everybody can get a chance to ask one or two if we can, and uh, I guess we'll start with Senator Schwank, and then we'll go from there, so. Thank you, Elder, and we'll wait till everybody gets up here. In terms of questions, you don't even know where to start because there is so much that we need to understand about this. I would like to say, first of all, I appreciate the work that everybody has done on this. Um, the testimony was really important, but probably the most powerful is that comes from the growers, from you, Calvin, and Mary Ann, and what you are experiencing. It's, it's, it's devastating. You can only spray so much. You have days to harvest issues that you've got to deal with. You, you are on the front lines of this, and it's unfair to make you handle all of this economically on your own without us in some way stepping up to be helpful. That's, that's critically important here. This is something unique. I know, um, Secretary um, Redding, you mentioned plum pox virus. That was a relatively limited scope in terms of, you know, who may have been impacted by it, although economically important too. I can't think of any industry that's not impacted by this, this situation. So starting with questions, one of the things that, that um, I, I think will be on everybody's mind, we're learning more about the insect and its biology and you know, what we can possibly do to control it. We think it has one generation a year. You know, I understand that we've never seen this before and we're learning as we go, I get that. But what are our plans for next year? It seems to me that this has, and especially listening to Calvin and Mary Ann, this has literally exploded in terms of population in the past year. At first, you know, we saw a couple, I saw a couple, I'm nowhere impacted as a homeowner the way that you are, but now it's just unreal. Are they coming in on storms, on the tropical storms, in terms of, you know, blowing? Are, they, are, are the populations growing, that, have they just outstripped? every kind of you know, method that we've tried to use to control it. Is our leading edge um, kind of um, strategy going to work on this? Because we see people that are directly impacted by it now. We can't afford to lose these, these folks. They're a big part of our economy. It's a bunch of questions. Whoever can start with that, I'd appreciate. I get one thing for Sven for you. A lot of these insects that, that are problems, their populations peak and then they, you know, they collapse. Do you think this is something that will happen with this too? Have we hit a peak or, you know, what's, what can we expect? That of course is our fondest hope, but you have to remember uh, when this went to Korea, it did peak after three years and collapsed in the fourth season. However, in Korea, they do have some parasites and predators and other natural enemies that attack them. It's unclear as to whether or not that will happen here. Uh, the DCNR did do a native parasitoid study, and they did find some parasitoids that were released on gypsy moth uh, attacking egg masses at a fairly high rate year two, but found none year three. So that's not encouraging to me. My professional opinion is it will probably collapse. At some point, most populations of insects reach a carrying capacity and do collapse. But you never know. It's an invasive species. It's in a new area. It has access to resources that it 
didn't have when it went to South Korea or in China. And we won't be here anymore in five years. And if it goes to Erie, it'll be the same cycle. They're going to have the ability to grow in populations, and waiting for collapse will collapse that industry as well. So that's the problem with that approach. What are our plans for next year, Secretary Redding? Well, you, you'll get a couple of different answers uh, here because I, I think you know Matt has shared I mean, these are real-time conversations uh, that we are in the midst of. I mean, almost by the hour, uh, and, and we've been working through. Uh, you know, what, what do you do based on the three years of experience we've had? And, and the reality is that uh, this year is different than the last, as Calvin and Marianne have, have uh, shared, and it's different than the year before. At the end of the day, though, uh, borrowing from what we learned from Plumpox is that you need a, a very aggressive approach. You need a full community involved in it. Uh, it's not about what the department or a grower or local governments or anybody else does. It really has to be the full community. Uh, there's a lot of research. You could spend uh, you know, all of your dollars right now on different aspects we heard in the last hour and a half of research. The strategy is, uh, you know, to expand, you know, the, the, the field force. Uh, that's a discussion about what resources are available. We're going to expand the research um, uh, topics, uh, the partners in the research. Uh, it is about, uh, you know, better understanding some of the economic impact um, that we have. Uh, we, we have an issue with how to remove um, the trees, how to, how, to, how to really be aggressive about the removal and destruction that's also barred from plum pox. But I, I don't want to uh, sit here and tell you that we, we've got this sort of the alpha and the omega <laughs> of this strategy. It, it is an evolving strategy that involves a lot of conversation with the USDA uh, and, and the partners to get there. But it will be um, aggressive. Uh, it will be comprehensive. Uh, it'll have to include, I think, more on the community outreach and engagement that uh, we, we've talked about here with, with uh, Emily this morning of that awareness. Um, but even with all of that, uh, this is a major threat, and, and we don't have a good answer. Uh, I don't know, Matt, if you want to share. I mean, you're in the thick of translating, you know, the working group's uh, efforts and the science. Yeah, as I mentioned in my in our prepared remarks, um, you know, we're putting a lot of effort right now into trying to develop a comprehensive strategy and resource requirements that we can communicate through our pop political leadership in the department um, to see what's what's possible. Clearly, the resources while we've provided um, fairly substantial resources, depending on the size of the problem that you're looking at. Clearly, it's not, it has not been enough to meet the need. Uh, and the, the, the methods that we've developed, that together with PDA, really with PDA at the forefront of this, uh, we, we feel we've got tools that can be effective. But the size, especially with the continued growth of the quarantine, um, you know, the, I referenced earlier the idea of this trying to work on that leading edge I think it's safe to say our, our goal is not to exclude the, the high volumes on the inside, but if we don't do a better job controlling the leading edge, it's not going to matter what's going on in the inside because the inside is going to be the state of Pennsylvania, you know, the rate of spread that, that we're seeing over time. So we have to find a way to contain it um, first. And, and if we can do that and Get the resources to do, you know, perform suppression activities, whether that be through the, the methods that are established currently in the program, through um, tree removals, um, herbicide treatments, um, pesticide treatments. If we can be effective at using those tools to suppress the populations, uh, you know, as part of our program, and work with growers, homeowners. So really, just again, everyone throwing the kitchen sink at it together. That's our hope that is the best way to be effective. But we really do feel that if we can't contain it and it continues to spread, the rate of spread, Sven could probably do a better job than me articulating just how much it's spread 
from where we were last year, but we're looking, we, I think it, two years ago, we were looking at, we thought maybe five kilometers a year or less, and this year we saw tw 12 in a, in, fr from, the, from the farthest out point that was known. So it continues to move, and if the population continues to grow, as it is, that risk just continues to get exponentially greater. There is a correlation between sort of the strategy and what we have in terms of available resources. I mean, our request to the USDA is 20 million. Uh, in discussions of the last couple of weeks, we think that's probably about half what you need. You're talking about a $40 million commitment wow. that we've got to figure out how to do this. And you, we all understand real-time discussions about what the budget limitations are. But uh, as you hear, I mean, that, that'll be a loss of, you know, a piece of Berks County alone economically. So th that's our discussion. So trying to, to gear this in, in a way that, that gets the field force that we think this is a human capital question, right? It's a question of, you know, the, the research dollars that are going to be predictable and sustainable over some period of time. It's an outreach strategy that's well beyond, uh, as, as Emily mentioned, uh, you, could, you could drop 10 more people into the conversation today and probably still feel short, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so they're the things that, that are in the strategy. Scaling of that strategy becomes part of the conversation in the next couple of weeks. We, we, we think the components are right. The question is scale. Thank you. I'm, we can talk again later about this. I'll let my colleagues proceed. Thank you. We have a number of members that want to ask questions. And uh, next we'll turn to Chairman Pashinsky. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your uh, testimony. We have an epidemic. Right? Uh, so if we were approaching this as a human epidemic, um, it may provide a little more sense of urgency. And I think that what we want to do is combine the loss of dollars, the loss of your potential businesses, uh, and then the incredible expansion of this disease to other parts of Pennsylvania and beyond. So my first question is, it, it appears that the commonality that we have between this insect and Pennsylvania is Korea. Have we done anything to begin to inspect whatever products are coming from Korea? Have we established that that is where this insect has come from, right? So, you know, uh, we're continuing to get imports uh, and what steps are being taken at this point first to take a look at that point of, of entry. Uh, the second thing is, uh, it appears as though you've got um, a plan, and um, my, my, my word is just, let, we gotta accelerate this. This appears to be an emergency. Um, I'm even thinking of the gypsy moth. Now, uh, up in northeastern PA, we've seen countless oak trees decimated because of the gypsy moth. The thing that is most disturbing, however, is there is a spraying technique that can control that, but funds weren't available. So I'm asking all of you to make it very clear what is needed exactly, and then it's gonna be up to us to try to help finance it and support your efforts. You're the experts in this field. And that's the comment that I would have to make. What are we doing about the imports? Because that's where it appears we got it. And it appears as though you've got a pretty good plan. You're bringing everybody on board. I'm asking that we accelerate this and uh, we continue the conversation um, in the sense that it is an emergency. So, thank you. Do you want to talk about uh, imports or Matt on, on PPQ? Um, certainly we can address the imports. Actually, Dr. Julie Urban uh, with Penn State uh, ran DNA analysis to see where it did actually come from. Korea was ruled out with her first analysis. We do believe it's probably China. The Pennsylvania population is distinct, which means it was one introduction. Uh, but immediately in 2014, uh, all of the ports received training. This wasn't something that was on their radar. It's a lanternfly. Uh, they don't really cause problems other places. Now it is, they have made interceptions since. So yes, we have shut off the faucet coming in and we do watch those very carefully. I appreciate that. Now, do you have a particular pesticide that can actually destroy this insect? 
many pesticides are extremely effective against this. We're using dinotefuran in our program, but other formulations are also very effective against this insect. And is there a reason why we're not extensively using that pesticide? The other pesticides? No, or what, what, pesticide whatever, whatever is most effective at eradicating this infestation. Um, we have used it up to the maximum label amount that's allowed and even gotten a 24C label which allows three times the amount per acre. And it is effective? It's killing the... Okay. When applied pro properly, it is. All right. So then if there was a large dissemination of this pesticide, would that address the, um, the need? And what yes, would be the you, cost? You have, to, you have to couple it with tree removal. You have to remove the host as well. Again, this is an epidemic. It's an emergency. What has to be done? What is the cost? And what do we need to do to implement? If you have a, if you have a pesticide that will eradicate them, now it may also cause other residual damage, all right? So you're, you're the experts. I'm just asking you, what is it going to cost? Because it all comes down to dollars and cents. So. If I could comment on that. Um, with the gypsy moth, we use a biorational insecticide that is relatively safe for pollinators and people and other things. Um, with the spotted lanternfly, we know the contact insecticides kill them. But it would be a traditional chemical with higher toxicity. And it's really hard to, with gypsy moth, they're feeding on the, you know, you can just dust the trees right, with these yes. biorational products. When the insects are down on the trunks of the trees, you'd really have to have a high volume application, and it would really have a big impact on our pollinators, and that's the last thing that people are trying to do right now. Along with the public concerns of using that kind of chemistry for those kind of blanket sprays. So that's why PDA is behind the systemic um, insecticides, which set up the trap trees in a very deliberate use of insecticides but it's just not as easy as the gypsy moth applications where you can use aerial sprays. That was what we were trying to teach in the program. We had the eight meetings this spring, and after 204 people listened to us teach them for two and a half hours, 11 trees were set up by the public. It's just not something that's really within the reach of the general public. Some people can do it with some education behind it, but it's just not as easy as the gypsy moth control strategy, unfortunately. Yeah, and uh, you're talking about the aerial spraying? Right. Yeah, you can't do that, but it, you have to do it from the trunk spraying. So we need Various more manpower is, is what you're saying, if, if yeah, we could approach if, it from that. If we could engage the public in going out and doing those applications on their own, we're trying to do that, but it, we haven't found a lot of people that have you know, the ability to do that at this okay. point. Okay, and I, I don't want to take anybody's time, but I thought it was intriguing about your observation on the transformer, and I think that should be pursued, pursued as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Representative Maloney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. <clears throat> A lot I could say we wouldn't have enough hours to really touch this um, from my perspective. Um, this first came to me by <clears throat> Secretary Gregg in um, 2014, as was mentioned, and um, some of the things that were alarming uh, to him him being an active farmer, um, but on the other side of the state, wasn't sure where this would go. Um, I, for the first time in the seven years that I have been here, have had my constituency override the property tax issue by an invasive bug. So that's pretty significant when you know where I come from. And many things that have been mentioned about cost, volunteers, all the things that have already been really reiterated um, have been exponential in my office. I'm being text messaged and email while I sit here from the public who is watching this. My biggest concern has been from the very beginning, bad communication. Um, been very involved um, with things with respect to this, along with all of the other state representatives' duties, 
And when you don't ask for this type of a thing to happen to us in the Commonwealth, it's, it's pretty alarming when there's so many questions about something that you don't really have the answers to. And so things that concerned me from the very beginning, um, I know did get implemented. I'm not so sure to what extent um, the public really was satisfied with, but I was concerned with the hunting season. I was concerned with trespass. I was concerned with identification of people who were on properties. I was, I, I was concerned with how do we assimilate this information. We had public hearings and, and meetings, um, been very concerned with the uh, pesticide and the things that has already been mentioned by Representative Pashinsky. Um, I produced an enormous amount of literature at my local fair, at my events, out of my office. These scrape cards, every single one of them times 10 could have been given out that I was given. So, so I'm glad my colleagues are able to see something that has been going on for quite a while. My neighbors sitting front and center here have been people that I was concerned with would be not only impacted personally, but I think one of the answers and one of the things that I would like to see take place is that our commercial properties must have priority. This is not only their personal investment, but it's the investment of the community and it's the investment of the state with revenue and product. So it seems to me that we must put a priority to properties. I shared with many people here that, um, look, I'm the epicenter of it. I live right in the middle. All those pictures are either my neighbors, could be my property, could be whatever with respect to where I live. So with the bans, I have heard, and I can't even give you the amount of, of constituency calls that I've gotten with, we don't get the bans, we don't know how to get a hold of anybody. Um, I've shared this with PDA on several different occasions. I, I'm not so sure where the communication problem is. You just heard testimony of an individual here who has been impacted in the same concern that I have had. So. The communication problem here, I think, is significant. I have people asking me for tax relief. I have people asking me, what about all the money that I have been spending on this pesticide, insecticide, the treatments, the removal of trees, all the things that you have heard in a small sense of testimony today have been front and center for my staff. And um, look, people can't sit on a patio. They can't walk in the house without having, I had a hunting blind, quite frankly, that looked like somebody sprayed it with glue, with the honeydew. So I saw that two years ago already and, and know what the impact of this is. Um, part of getting people jobs, you probably haven't mentioned in any of the details with respect to the part-time help that is seasonal that is trying to do the boots on the ground work for this, I'm not so sure that it's, it's not a full-time type approach now. Um, the part-time folks, no doubt, are appreciative for that seasonal work, but I think we need to approach this in a much more aggressive manner, as Representative Pashinsky has, has already said. So I don't want to take more of the time that other representatives who have never seen this before till today um, would have, but I don't want to be shut out of communication anymore. That happened to me early on in this process. Um, I think it's very inconsiderate to the constituency of Pennsylvania and especially to my neighbors. And so um, very, very concerned with this economic potential not only to my neighbors, but to where this is going. My wife grew up on an orchard. I still live on that property. And I never identified my property as being one to be treated. I wanted the others to be treated because I felt that that's where the importance was and wanted to see the help go to those folks. 
And so as Mr. Rhodes received a text message from his dad, why do you think he would get a test message like that from his dad? Well, you can mold, I can't even repeat the things that I've been told by my constituents. I couldn't even verbally repeat that today. That's how aggressive some of them have taken this concern. So again, um, many questions about the pesticide and the insecticide issues I do have. Um, I've been told that some of the information that we gave out wasn't maybe what some people agree to. As you saw today, the Fed and the state, as we refer to it as, don't agree necessarily on how we approach this. Um, I believe they both have tremendous points and I think that needs to be an effort put together to, to approach this. So I appreciate it. I know um, I didn't really give more questions as I did more statement today, but I can't probably reiterate enough what the last three years especially has been like living in this epicenter. So thank you. Thank you, Representative. We're certainly short on time, but we have a number of other members that, that would like to ask questions. Uh, Representative Delisio, if you could be, it will be very brief, brief and to the point. Chairman, very brief. Uh, it, it centers around communication. Mr. Beekman, I heard what you said when you said no one had visited you, uh, you and Marianne are the epicenter, et cetera. And I just, there's two things. We all deal with constituents. And uh, so, it is important to have communication and you have to feel like you're in the loop, but do you think there is anything that a visit would have added to the database or the information that they already have? And I only say that for one reason, sir, is that resources are limited. They are very finite. If you were here last night, you would have heard that during the budget discussion. So that I am, I am hoping I don't know for certain that the department is using its resources in the most productive way, efficiently, but I do want to validate what you said in terms of it is frustrating that you're dealing with this on an hour by hour basis. But is there anything that you think the department may have overlooked as a result of not having visited? Well, my, my situation there comes into the fact that I have participated and they have trapping programs on my farm. Uh, we have worked with a person with research from Penn State that's doing the, the program there. The, the trappings have been going on. I never hear, what do you catch? What numbers do you see? Is the efficacy of what I do in my general maintenance programs taking care of the problem? I do in my own scouting programs, okay? Again, back to hey. what problems are we seeing? what's happening. If they don't stop and ask us, I am so busy, I do not have the time to track them down because nobody's ever at the office. So a mechanism to share that type of information as well. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Clunk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm a state rep in an area that is thankfully right now outside of the infestation zone. However, I represent Southern York County. I neighbor Adams County, have family members who live in Adams County who operate apple orchards. So for me, my question to the panel is, as a state representative outside of this infestation zone, one, what are you doing to educate those folks in neighboring counties like mine to prevent the spread and infestation coming to us and what can I do and other members here of the committee to help educate our constituents so that it does not come to our local communities? And how can we help you in this fight outside of the infestation zone? Well, Penn State Extension has had newsletter articles on all of our commodity focused sites and also our home gardener sites. Um, so we're delivering the information that way, but uh, we certainly could use help. Um, Senator Schwank has um, posted some of our newsletters in, in her direct mailings to her constituents. Um, we work with uh, townships that put newsletter articles um, out there. I think our Master Gardener volunteer network across the state is going to really be instrumental, and I'm um, heavily involved in training them on a day-to-day -day basis. But 
I'm one person, we have one other extension educator, and we, we both had full jobs before the lanternfly came. <laughs> so um, the good news is that Penn State Extension will be hiring a new extension associate to hopefully coordinate you know, the educational message coming out of the college. And that position, I hear, has just been posted today, so we are looking for that individual. On the private side, uh, I mentioned that we did have the director of the Northeast Pennsylvania uh, Wine Association. Uh, we, d we did reach out as a group to invite, invite that person to our uh, farm. Uh, we, we welcome anybody in the state, so if you want to send people over to see what's going on, what we're doing, uh, we are always happy to host people and get the word out. Yeah, there, there's a couple um, of examples. I mean, I think the the High Path AI uh, outreach that was done through the House and Senate offices over the last couple of years was extraordinary, right? And very effective because it helped us get to the backyard flocks and some of those other issues. So that that model exists where information that we produce or extension produces uh, to push that out through newsletters. I mean, I know uh, the, the monthly uh, radio, TV, uh, social media outreach that's done through the legislature opportunities for us to partner with you or, or provide uh, information would be helpful. Uh, we've got to get all of the commodity organizations, I think, so your re relationship with farm bureaus uh, and, and growers and others from just on the economic side become a, a key part of that. Um, and you're, you're all great translators, right? You take all this information and, and make that sort of accessible both in terms of, of material but also helping us uh, explain to the, to the larger uh, public what implications are. Uh, so any of that, that that you can do would be most important, I think. Amplify what it is that we're doing um, out in the public about implication because I think we keep bumping into there's just sort of a level of ignorance around what what actually is is happening but also then what what is on the uh, on the cusp of as we've seen this year happening um, that would be most important so then just a, a quick follow-up question I know that the tree removal of, of these trees of heaven is very very important because that's the the host plant for um, the later fly would you recommend then in, in our areas that are outside of the infestation zone to communicate to constituents that please, if you see one of these on your property, to remove it? And if so, how would they properly dispose of it? Um, we actually have on our webpage uh, guidelines for homeowners uh, that Extension has worked on and also uh, the document that we have on how to do the tree removal as well as establish trap trees. So that's available on our webpage currently. It's important, important to follow the guidelines because as noted, it's a particularly invasive plant and if you cut it and you don't take care of it properly, you run the risk of having the same problem pop back up next year, possibly worse than before. I think Rep Representative Clunk's question, though, is outside of that quarantined area. So if you're in York or Adams, I mean, do you take the, you know, the, the proactive approach to? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think without a doubt. And, okay. and, and to the, your, your first question, too, on the issue of communication, you know, we've been talking, PDA and, and USDA, about a, an update to our plan, more comprehensive accounting of resource requirements. One of the key aspects of this is communication is a challenge because there are so few people who are dedicated, focused on this as a full-time role. And so that's one of the needs that we've taken note of in, and are trying to address that in, in developing the plan that we'll present to our leadership. And I'm sure PDA will be you know, discussing with Secretary Redding otherwise, too. Representative Hahn, we have two minutes left. So I guess you're last. Thank you. I'm usually pretty brief anyway. Um, I'm in Northampton County, so I know we had one area and now I think we have four. But can I assume that it doesn't have to be an agricultural, it could be on my, my home. So I could be out visiting somewhere in Berks, bring these insects back in my car and then separate it out. So I think one of the things when we're talking about communication, I do post on my email blast about it, but I'm just assuming in my head farms. But I think now we have to make sure 
that we're getting out to the general public. So I just wanted to make sure I had that correctly. And are we identifying um, how they're coming into Northampton County? Do we know if it was someone visiting another area and bringing it in? Is it in wood? Do, do we know that? Um, we can identify the pathway for every introduction into a new area, but there are instances where we have found people visiting hunting clubs with an open bed pickup truck, um, people with RVs, individual companies that do a lot of traffic between one area and another. So yeah, we do try to track down the pathway as much as possible. There's a lot actually tied to our uh, transit systems. So our rail lines, our major highways, uh, just because of what you saw when you open your door, it is possible to get five to 10 of them in your vehicle, even if you're trying to be careful. And if you're not trying to be careful, you know. Gas stations need to be treated. I don't know if you could hear it, but we've gotten the call to get back into session. This has probably been one of the most valuable um, hearings that I participated in it. When I worked with my fellow chairs to convene this, one of our goals, one of my big goals, was to make sure that my colleagues on the Ag Committee understood what we're facing in Berks County, but what you will be facing in the future if this year's growth in terms of the population of insects continues. We have a huge problem on our hands. We're gonna need a lot of resources and continued meetings and you know outreach from you in terms of the public, particularly to our commercial growers. Everything, you know, when you're talking about everything from alfalfa to basil, this means every aspect of, of Pennsylvania agriculture that we can possibly think of. I would ask, and in consultation with Senator Vogel, that we convene again, perhaps in January, to talk about what you've um, continued to find out. We cannot, we cannot just say this was nice, we had a hearing, and move on. This is a problem we are going to be dealing with, and we've got to be engaged, both legislators and the folks that we rely on to help deliver the programs that we need and the resources that we need as well. So thank you to all of you. You took the time to come up here um, to provide us with this information and we'll continue to reach out to you. Thank you. You're welcome. And you have our One last quick thing if I could. Um, I want to thank everybody for the information. It's been informative and something that Representative Keller I know was going to ask for and, and would help um, in, in the talks about communication legislators' offices can be very helpful in distributing information. So if, if there's a way for you to provide us some, some, uh, some information, points. some talking points, I guess is what I'm looking Absolutely. for, that we could use to develop this information in a concise manner yeah. to actually get out to the constituents, that, that would be helpful for all of us. We'll, we'll get that to you. And, and thank you. I think the, the key uh, in the timing of this also is the strategy is still sort of a draft strategy. Right, and real time, but draft, and, and having the feedback and understanding where, you know, folks have been living this for the last couple of years, you know, right in the right in the center of it. Where can we do a better job? How do we enhance the communication? Where do you, you know, place people if you have them, et cetera, et cetera? And I think that's really been valuable today to say we've got a communication component in the strategy, but it needs to be enhanced, right? And that's both internal and and the outreach component of that as well. So, uh, thank you all. Thank you, Secretary Redding. Thank you, the rest of our panelists, for being here today. And we'll uh, thank you very much for your information. We'll convene sometime in the future to discuss this again. Thank you. Thanks, Elder. Yep. Thanks, Elder. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks Marty. Marty.